welcome to Intro Psych Sessions, the second season where I will rethink my entire Intro Psych course from beginning to end, asking friends and experts to help me figure out how to put it together in a way that implements recommendations and integrates the skills and knowledge that I want to give to my students. And who better to join me on this adventure, co-hosting the series with me, than Dr. Regan A.R. Guram. This is Intro Psych Sessions, Season 2, and I hope that these conversations will help you as you think about your students and your own intro course. Let's get to it. And now, a word from our sponsor. Endless distractions, overbooked schedules, information overload. Students face so many barriers to being fully engaged with their schoolwork. That's why Macmillan Learning's Achieve for Psychology gives you the tools you need to keep them focused on your course, before, during, and after class. Whether it's the exclusive author-created content, captivating footage in our introductory psychology video collection, or the self-evaluation of our goal-setting and reflection surveys, Achieve helps students stay focused on the course and makes it easy for them to tell you when they need extra help. See for yourself. Go to MacmillanLearning.com slash Psych Sessions 2023 special for an introductory tour today. Macmillan's Achieve for Psychology, engaging every student, supporting every instructor, setting the new standard for teaching and learning. Hi. Hi. Are you done with your term? Oh my God, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I have some ideas that uh, of places I want to start, but maybe you have ideas too. Uh, the The point of this, completely selfish, I am redoing my intro psych course. We've learned a lot over the last number of years. I've learned a lot personally, and now I'm trying to put it into practice. But as Regan and I have been talking, we realize that it almost always leads to a values conversation, um, and and you can't have everything. Uh, and what I, we can talk about whatever you're interested in talking about. Um, I can tell you a little bit about what I'm doing, but I thought maybe I would start with assessment with you. Surprise. Sure. <laughs> surprise, surprise, surprise. Yeah. yeah. So let me give you a quick overview and listeners are probably tired of hearing this, uh, and Regan, correct me if I'm wrong, but, um, here, here's my, my class is an 11 week quarter where I see students about four hours a week. That's in the face-to-face -face version. We haven't, there, there should be another series for the online version, but, or the hybrid version for that matter. But um, in this face-to-face -face version, what I have kind of relied upon and I like is moving through content, um, you know, pretty, pretty quickly, but basically week by week that every week is sort of a module and, um, and, and it aligns to some content area or something like that. So, sort of, but at, at it, it's going to run like a cycle. So I have students doing pre-reading um, before we get to class. Um, it's going to be flipped. So for the first time, I am doubling down, committing to active learning in the classroom, which could be very broad. It could be from, hey, here's some questions I want you to write about for you know 30 minutes, or it could be, hey, take this personality inventory and let's talk about our results for, for that. So um, there's a lot of different things that that time together could be. But then in the end, um, it culminates in a five part weekly assessment. Um, and I'm going to pull that up right now because I don't have it open. So um, <laughs> I should have prepped. But uh, so so far, any questions while I'm pulling that up or reading yeah, you, you want to jump in? In the end, you'll have a five part assessment. That's the end of the 11 weeks. That's the end of the each week. Each week. Each week. Okay. Hmm. That's the end. Now my class size is small like yours. I mean, I think you, you, you're a little smaller than mine for your intro psych class, but I'm 33. What are you again? When I teach intro, and I haven't for a little while for a mm -hmm. variety of reasons, I have had the pleasure of the honors intro assignment, and that that's caps right. at 15. Yes. Yep. That's right. Well, yeah. and, and I think, you know, while you're pulling it up, I think that's, that's what... You know, on one hand, we often uh, revert to uh, if I had a smaller class, I would, 
right? And, you know, recently I really pushed myself to say, how would I teach the course if I had three people? And how can I scale it up to my 400 people? Now, of course, it's not not everything will scale up, but I think that's the benchmark I'm really been pushing myself to from a course design standpoint is if I feel, what do I feel would most benefit a three-person class and why can't, how, many, how much more of that can we do for the bigger one? So I think whether it's 15 or 33, I think, you know, I, I just love the, how does your assessment change and how should it change? And when are you compromising your assessment just because of class size? And that's the, that's that intersection with values that I think Garth alluded to. That's that's so neat to face, face up front. Let me add just one more mechanical uh, opportunity. And that is... Um, I have ad adopted the habit of having undergraduate TAs in all my classes. And the value of that, besides giving students who are interested in teaching an interesting pathway to try it out and see how the sausage is made, um, it really allows me to do much more in assessment because I can have undergrad TAs grade low stakes assessments that are rubric driven. And so whether it's intro or another class, um, I, I can really do th things that I think will make the class high impact and memorable, regardless of size. Well, um, yeah, and, and I have the, you know, I have the privilege of having this smaller class. And yet not everything, not everything is easy, even for 33, right? Mm -hmm. It's not it's not three people. And so, Regan, I do think that there is something there now. OK, so here it is. These it's a. I don't want to kill myself with grading. Trust me, I've learned. Um, but at the end of the week, I do want these smaller assessments. Now I'm using the IPI themes. Okay. So real quick, here are the five things that I'm going to assess at the end of the week. Um, basically, these are the content area, apply psychology. You can see it here. Improve your life with psychology. That's what I'm basically asking them to do. A apply to their lives. Um, solve a problem with psychology where I give a problem. They solve it. Um, and these are like they're doing this in 100 words, basically, these two. Um, then provide example of psychology's themes it's directly from the IPI. Um, so I'll ask them to do two of those each week. And then articulate your skills. So this is using the skillful psychology student document uh, that came out of uh, that working group. I think it was a working group. Um, and then finally, communicate to the general public. Um, so this would be something creative, more like an infograph. And so I've got here, I've got content. I've got, it, there's some critical thinking, which is our second outcome for IPI, right? Um, which is, I think, the solve a problem. And then there is the themes and then communicate communicating to the general public. And then I threw skills in there because I think it's important for students to be able to articulate what it is that they are doing. Uh in this class and then hopefully building that skill of articulating what you're doing for other classes to come. So those are the five. And I have some kind of closeted thoughts about those, those five things. And anyway, but I'd, I'd love to get your just kind of a cold read on, on what you think about kind of assessing five things weekly again and again and again and again. I'm going to predict by about week six, you're going to hate the fact that you designed it this way. Okay. <laughs> um, just because, I mean, the design is fundamentally good, but um, some of the lessons that they're learning from that design might not necessarily require that to be weekly. Um, so that that's one thing that strikes me. Um, but But especially, I think you will be plowing through a lot of assessment for those 33 students. And so I wonder if there isn't some way you could pair that back without losing the heart of what you're doing. Okay. Regan, I have thoughts, yeah. but what are you hearing here from her? Yeah, you know, that's, that's actually, uh, so in my gen psych class and we have got the same structure 10 or 11 weeks uh interestingly enough i'm almost like at the other end of what garth tried because we started off maybe two years ago by having an applied learning assignment every week okay every week and uh the students are were and are writing about 
uh, 300 to 500 words a week. And mind you, keeping with my philosophy, this my class is 400. So, and I do have uh, people to help out with, you know, reading through it and making comments on it. But that said, we started off with an applied learning assignment for uh, every week because it was chewing on it and getting deeper. But Jane, like like you said, we've actually moved it. I've actually moved it down to seven. Uh, and that's much more manageable because two things happened. Number one, not only was it a, a big workload for students and me, uh, but I think the big, if it was just workload, I'd never like just workload to be the issue. I'd try to find a solution to the workload part. And, you know, there is really good research saying that structured weekly assignments are good, right? The whole inclusive teaching thing says that. So that's not the issue. The bigger thing, Jane, was, I, I don't think you said this, but students began to see it as, rep, you know, repetition. And right. that doing it, for, even though it was a structured template, uh, template that was became difficult for students. So that's, you know, I would say that that would be my prediction as well as downstream, you'd be cut back on those. So you're still doing it, but you're mixing it up a little bit, you know, you're mixing it up a little bit. So there are different types of assessments. In there. Okay. And so you have now, Jane, uh, you're commented two things for me. I feel like uh, I feel like I got caught with my my hand in the candy jar a little bit. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But I also feel a great sense of relief, like I wanted to get caught because it's <laughs> it, it's too much. Yes, yeah. it's too much. Now, I know it's too much for me. Now, I'm wondering, is it too much for my students? And and Regan, I was going to ask you basically what with your comment just now, were you suggesting that students? I know it's good. The repetition is good for inclusivity, right? That's another right. great. OK, but are students going to at the end of the quarter say, all we did was the same thing every single week and not not enjoy that process. So I'm going to answer no to that because anticipating that, anticipating that. Uh, so two things here. Firstly, a lot of things look really good on paper until you take it for a test drive. Right. Uh, and I think, you know, I'm speaking with the wisdom of modifying my applied learning assignments over three years after active thinking. Uh, and right off the bat, I tried to make each applied learning assignment very, very different. You know, so they are watching a TED talk one week. They are looking at a social media piece the other week. They are doing a behavioral change the third week. Uh, they are doing a sleep journal the fourth week, and so on and so forth. So it was sort of different, but I think what I, what I mean by the the repetition, it was oh, every Friday we've got this three hundred word thing due. You know, and you know that's not too bad. But very quickly, when you when you factor in, take a holistic approach, and you look at, you know five classes and for the bulk of the students what i realized was i had to uh, really push up my helping them plan right so you mentioned skills and now i spend a lot of time on scheduling and helping them plan i stick to my you know i stick to my structure of here are the things that are due Every week or every other week, and that right there's the compromise. Every other week, but I put more structures in place to help them plan out their weeks. So it's I hear you have a lot, but I'm going to help you make it possible. And you know, Garth, you, we've talked about the differences between our schools, and I think there are some things that are common, though. I mean, you know, in some of these conversations with our with our friends, we've even talked about how, because of the pandemic, students are coming in with handicaps, right? They're, they're coming in, they're coming in behind, they're coming in with without certain skills, right? Um, and I think planning is one of them. That was also an issue before the pandemic, but I think it's even more so now. Okay. So one of the things I heard you say, Regan, there was uh, bringing some freshness even within the system. So even if they're doing these things a lot, make sure that there are some fresh opportunities. Uh, some, they're having students do some different things. Jane, I want to get back to you because I, I think that um, one of the reasons I get stuck, and this is why I started telling you I'm in this cycle. And at the end of every cycle, I have this assessment is because... 
my course is still very content driven as an intro site course. I just think it is right. And so let's say I did half the assessment every second week I did this. Then I'm now I don't know how to assess both biological psychology in week three and social psychology in week two. If I am doing just one assessment every couple of weeks, there's just not room for me to get a feel of what my students are learning. Um, I know there's probably a way to solve that, but it, it, does my concern, do you understand my, what I'm saying here? I, I do understand your concern. And I think, um, and maybe it's just because reading this present, but <laughs> maybe if you took a pillar approach to this, I mean, the structure of the assessment that you've done is good. It's just that 11 times, I think, would grade on me and the students as well. Yep. So if you were doing that assessment based on um, coordinating the modules so that they represent a pillar, that would work. The other um, insight I think I would have is that there's nothing that says that you have to standardize every assessment. And yeah. so um, in, in the wrap up that you do and whatever the final is, you can certainly pull in all of the things that are on this um, assessment format that you've created. But it, it, maybe what you do in biology is entirely different than what you do in social. It doesn't have to be quite as regimented as as I hear you saying. Yep. Um, so yeah. You're suggesting that what if instead of doing, let's say, 10 assignments what if i broke it down into pillars and that cuts the number of assignments in half that, uh, that's one solution mm -hmm. the other would be assess every module but give yourself some freedom to do different things with modules and so let me tell you about what i do in biology yep uh, i love this that um all of the courses all of the modules topic areas that are related to biology sensation perception etc um I ask, I give students a take home exam and in the beginning of the class, they've told me what they like to do when they're not studying. So the exam is tell me how you do that. Go back and look at brain function. I give them a kind of a structured um, protocol that they have to work their way through. One of the questions is flip a coin. If it's uh, heads, then you just developed a tumor on the right side. Tell me what's going to happen to your ability to do the thing you love. And in the end, students will say to me, this was hard. And I'll say, yeah, it was. And they say, and what's more, I'm never going to be able to do this without thinking about intro psych. I said, great, because yeah. that's exactly <laughs> what I wanted to have happen. Um, and while, while you could apply that structure to biology, I think making something very personal, that was sort of the first part of your ass assessment protocol is what gives the um, content staying power. It's what's going to stay with students long after the course is over. And I would much rather they have interesting, memorable, different experiences. Maybe one module ends with a group experience. Maybe one module ends with the maybe an infographic is the end game for one module. Yeah. <laughs> so I think figuring out how to change it up especially for intro when, again, we know for a majority of students, this is our last last chance to be influential in how regular citizens are going to think about the science of psychology. Okay, just a little note before Regan sure. talks. Garth, in the future, please re-listen to the last two minutes of Jane <laughs> talking. Okay, go ahead, Regan. Well, you know, something something else that I remember learning from Jane uh, that I'm reminded of here is there's a very uh, there's a very easy other way to carve nature at its joints, which is have uh, you know the seven th seven themes, right? So one of those kind of assignments for each theme, and it doesn't matter which what content. And I think that's the magic of what the the woolly mammoths, uh, aka the the APA IPI student learning outcome groups, uh, came up with, is is by moving away from content to saying, look, focus on these themes. That's actually the perfect structure for assessment for us is make sure you have one really good assessment for each theme. Voila. Then you automatically cut off that, that issue. And it doesn't matter what the content there, you know, it's used, but you're getting at the, at the theme. Yeah, there is this, there is a possibility that I'm still trying to do too much with my course. That's kind of the, what the, 
at, at this point, I feel like I have dropped so much content. I feel like I have dropped so much assessment even. I mean, even up until up through the IPI work, I was having my students write so much to the point where my strategy was I'm going to selectively grade and they're going to be okay with that. I'm only going to select 20% of what they're graded and look at that, which I'm fine with. Actually, that's still a strategy on the table here. Um, and, but what what you're saying, Regan, is is still pushing me. Even having taught this class for 20 years, it's still pushing me to say, no, you can still let go of more. If this class is supposed to do what, if hmm, the 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 gift of this class is not necessarily its content, <laughs> it's it is it is its content. But the gift of this class is so much more, and I think the content has been it's been an, uh, it's it's been an uneven balance with what this class can do. We we agree with that, Jane. Mm -hmm. yeah. We do. Um, I think. If what we're trying to do is use intro psychology as an opportunity to introduce the skills that psychological thinkers develop, then it really makes wide open the kinds of things that you can introduce for student learning experiences that are, and I am you know, I hate to drag in the phrase that's now making all accreditors happy, but um, I, psych, intro psych is the perfect place for high impact practices. Um, what you do should be memorable. And frankly, multiple choice tests are not memorable. Do, are, do they have a place? Sure. Um, but students aren't going to remember much of what they get tested on that way, but they are going to remember when they were with a group and had to do an infographic about what should you punish your child. Those are the things that they're going to remember. And I think uh, we, we're, we really want to be in this for the Velcro learning. We want the stuff that's going to stick. Mm. And, and and along those lines, I mean, for, for both of you, uh, remind the listeners and me, uh, you, you, you are doing one term or semester for intro psych, correct? I think that's really important to keep in mind because uh, at Oregon State, we have two terms where we can split it up, which allows a lot more opportunities for activities and things like that. But Gert, your, your redesign, we're still talking about you redesigning a one term that's intro right. psych class. Yeah. Yeah. In a 11, quarter. 11 In, weeks. Yep. Yep. I mean, it's intense. This is the other thing and I that I think is actually quite unique to, to 11 week quarters is if your students get sick for a week, they miss 10% of the class. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. It's, it is, um, it is not conducive to like life going poorly for a short stint of time for students. Um, hey, I know that uh, we're kind of up against the clock here. I want to I wanted to share where I'm at after this conversation. I have a, I have a choice to make because I like this. I love structure. Okay, so I like the structure. I love the five things I'm assessing. Um, there's and I don't think anybody would disagree. Those are great things. I've got to figure out how to bring some variation within that. And I also have to figure out not to burn myself out or my students out with the, the repetition. So I need a strategy. Now, spec grading is an interesting thing to think about here because, and, and this is one of the opportunities, because you could have students um, kind of earn their points for the course by doing, say, there's 10 assignments saying you've got to do um, you know, six of these to get uh, a B or eight of these to get an A. And it's really up to you how much you decide to do. And out of the 10, you got to do eight or something like that. Okay. That doesn't feel great. Um, there's also a, um, the pillar sort of thing that I'm resonating with, which is let's make this a biweekly um, assignment. And I actually like that. It gives me room to actually work on the assignment with my students or to give them feedback in real time and use some of the class time to do that. And then um, I think there is a third way here, and that is to take these five things and uh, have students turn in something at the end of each week, but maybe not all five, maybe what lends itself to the content. Where Do you have a preference of those three? Anything stick out to y'all? I think I prefer, based on your description, um, the third, 
because I think it allows you to have the most variety of what will engage students. Um, the second also has appeal and in way last position would be spec grading. Yep. Yep. Okay. Regan. Yeah. You know, I, I think, um, I go back and forth on, on, on those, uh, and I go back and forth on those and I'm still really playing, playing with things in my head. So, yeah. uh, you know, come back to me. Okay. In, in some <laughs> time, will. come back, come back to me in some time. Yeah. You know, I will, Jane, we, uh, Regan and I, after all these conversations, we usually just sit down, keep the mic on. And then we, um, I don't know, <laughs> lose our minds thinking through all this great stuff we've heard from folks. So, uh, Jane, you did not, uh, let me down. I, I really feel like, and I think it's because of, uh, how long you've been doing this, your expertise. Forever. In- I've been doing it forever. <laughs> but you, you really are, uh, you're a great coach. And, um, so, and so I really appreciate you, your, your feedback. And obviously when you speak, I listen and, um, and thanks for taking the time. My pleasure. 